everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. This is Talks and today we have with us a very good friend of mine, Luca Masseron. I have known him for several years and uh, we came to know each other. We took part in competitions together, we learned together, we failed together. And uh, Luca has written a lot of books in machine learning and data science and I'm sure you have read some of his books. Even Mark Cuban is a fan of his books, like uh, one of the books like machine learning for dummies and he says that he keeps a copy of it in his bathroom and that helps him to uh, learn about machine learning and be a better investor right yes thank you abhishek for my great introduction thank you for inviting me first of all it's uh, really a pleasure being here to talk uh, with you and we all the audience that's following us and um, Anytime you want, we can start because there's, there's a, really a lot of stuff I want to to tell sure. everyone. Today. I'm very excited to learn today and I, I think everyone else is also very excited. So let's learn about hacking by chain optimization and the screen is all yours, Luca. Uh, thank you very much. So let's start. I will share my screen. And okay, you already introduced me. Uh, quite extensively. I can only add uh, that I'm Google Developer Expert and that actually I'm here today talking to you about uh, Bayesian optimization because I had an entrustment from GDE to talk about the same topic at a recent initiative. So let's talk in detail more about the motivation of this talk. Recently Kaggle has organized a very interesting initiative for everyone wanting to start with machine learning, especially with competitive data science. It has been the 30 days of machine learning. And in this initiative, I've been asked to prepare a tutorial and the tutorial was on bias optimization. Actually, it was a basic tutorial. I will reprise a part of it during this intervention this evening, but actually during the initiative, a lot of questions arose and they were all very interesting and actually not so for beginners. First of all, I've been asked why I use Scikit-Optimize, which is one of the open source packages for Bayesian optimization, instead of Optuna, which actually has the upper hand in all Kaggle competition because it's more performant. And a lot of people actually ask me, because the competition involved using gradient boosting, if in Bayesian optimization, they can use early stopping instead of optimizing the number of iterations as part of the hyperparameters. And then, of course, everyone asked if they can use Bayesian optimization for neural networks, even if you know neural networks were not the strongest algorithm in the competition. And finally, two interesting questions were about uh, making Bayesian optimization even faster Actually, the comparison was always with Optunan. And if I can, you know, have more GPU time. So actually leverage, you know, more free uh, GPUs that you can get from Kago, from uh, Colab, and so on. So based on the motivations, I prepare this talk, which actually will last about 45 minutes. There's some space for question and answering. And it will start with some notions to be everyone on the same page. It's about hyperparameter optimization and it's about Bayesian optimization, the first part, which just will detail, you know, a few basics. So we are all on the same page. Then we will deep dive on scikit optimize, doing step by step. Actually, we won't talk about their API as can tell, which is another thing actually. And I will present to you some very interesting X that you can use for cargo competition, but especially for your work, especially for your own projects, and then the space for the question and answering. So if you are ready, we can start with a very brief you know, explanation about what are hyperparameter, what are hyperparameter optimization, especially. So as you know, machine learning algorithms have a lot of knobs. They have a lot of hyperparameters, and success often comes from you know twiddling, uh, changing them. Uh, a lot and uh, in the best way. This is uh, uh, a quote from Pedro Domingos in his very famous uh, uh, paper about a few useful things to know about machine learning. And uh, 
you can wonder why are so important well if we see machine learning as creating a function that can map your inputs to an output well that function actually can be made of uh, learnable and not learnable parameters so for instance if you have uh, a machine learning algorithm with uh, the above function actually by changing the gamma from zero to one you can pass from a linear to a quadratic model and you may wonder why i cannot learn gamma maybe because it's not differentiable like all the other betas in, in the model so you need to find a way to get the best gamma for your model and here has been born the idea that you can tweak in a systematic way your parameters. Let's see an example here with a support vector classification. This is a common algorithm that you find in scikit-learn. And basically, even if you change one single parameter, in this case, the C, which is uh, a regularization parameter, you can have very different functional forms uh, separating your two classes in this very simple exemplification. So how can you do? The first, uh, first idea that everyone has is tuning by hand. Um, it can make you laugh thinking that you can, you know, in a host of hyperparameters that decide what to put just by chance or by your knowledge. But actually, this is uh, the, one of the principal choices by Grandmaster and Master in Kaggle competition, and not just uh, for them. If you go, for example, to see the papers presented at NeoRips in 2019, you will find that 80% of all the papers present, you know, tuning by hand or by very simple methods, uh, hyperparameter optimizations only 6% used Bayesian optimization. So this is actually not something that you have to exclude completely, but tuning by hand has its own perils, because if you want it to be successful, you really have to know what you're doing. So for instance, if you are just working with a very simple K nearest neighbor algorithm, you know that by changing the number of neighbors, you can have an algorithm with more bias or more variance. But as soon as you go into a very complex, high-dimensional system of hyperparameters, basically an hypercube, your intuition, your domain knowledge may fail, and you may find it difficult to actually uh, manage to get the best parameters, the best hyperparameters for your model to work. So some solution aroused the most basic solution that first appears is the grid search. Grid search is conceptually very simple. You try all the possible combinations of your hyperparameters. But of course, your hyperparameters have to be discrete. They cannot be continuous. So for example, if you have a, a hyperparameter like C, which is continuous from, for example, let's take 0 0.001 to 1000, you can pick any one of this number as a value, or you can pick some selected value. So this actually is really causing some problem to you because you have to pick the exact discrete, you know, numbers you want to test. And this works actually if you have very few hyperparameters to test and very few actually values to combine to deliver. Let's see this example, which is actually using support vector machines. As you can see, you just have, for example, two possible kernels, linear and radial basis function. And for each one, you are just you know, testing a very limited number of C values. And in the case of a radial basis function, a limited number of gamma. The combination are just a little number. So it's just you know, two kernels multiplied by four C values. And in the case of a RBF, you have an additional of course, two gamma values multiplied by four C uh, values. This limited number can be easily handled, actually, because you can just run this algorithm in a parallel way, and it works perfectly. But when you have, you know, more complex algorithm, a larger number of hyperparameters, this won't work. So a new approach emerged. It's random search. 
random search is even more intuitively simpler than a grid search because in random search you pick the combination to be tested just randomly and in case of continuous variables you can pick the number to be part of a combination just by sampling the distribution so you don't need to discretize anymore as in grid search random search has also a very great advantage of a grid search in grid search let's imagine that you have an hyperparameter which is actually an influential uh, in respect of your problem, this is not uncommon. Some problems, uh, given by the data you have attend, maybe are insensible to the change of certain hyperparameters. And in grid search, actually, this is always tested because you are testing all the combinations. But in random search, even if you are actually testing, of course, different simple values for the influential hyperparameters, this actually is overlooked by the fact that at the same time you are testing other values on other hyperparameters which are significant for your problem. So it is more efficient, especially if you don't have enough domain knowledge to know what's working, what is not working your problem. And again, it is extremely uh, parallel. So if you have, a, um, of course, computational resources, you can easily apply random search. At the moment, random search is the benchmark for all the hyperparameters optimization problems. And you may be surprised, it is often used in the AutoML system, especially when you have a lot of hyperparameters. Customary, for example, there is this paper that reports that in some Google hyperparameter optimization systems, they have a limit of 16 uh, parameters to be optimized in order to use sophisticated ways. If you have more than 16, you just go for random search. But again, you have a problem. Random search relies, of course, on sampling. So before you get actually the actual, the most effective combination, it may take time and it may take many samples depending on the complexity of a space and the complexity of a problem. So here we see, for example, okay, always with uh, the uh, support vector machine example that now you just need to sample from the log uniform distribution. And here is an example of how it actually works. And you can immediately perceive that, uh, you know, choosing uh, discrete values for grid search, which is are just the points uh, in a blue with a white background. It's not always a good choice if you really cannot uh, um, calibrate it to your problem. Meanwhile, random search just by simply by probability uh, on a distribution, it's much more effective. As I was saying, maybe you may wonder now if there is a way to leverage how you are hyper, uh, you know, uh, how you are experimenting with your hyperparameters. We mentioned that grid search and random search are actually just parallel. So every time you run an experiment, this experiment is completely independent from the other and is completely uninformed about what the other experiments are doing, if they're doing well or not. So you may wonder if you can leverage this information because as you proceed with experiments, you know more and more about the hyperparameter space. And then you may wonder also if you actually have a way that doesn't require you to be an expert of all the machine learning algorithms you want to optimize. Because as we said, for example, with manual tuning, you really need a very strong knowledge of the domain of a problem, of a different solution that have been applied to that problem. And of course, you may also wonder if you can find a faster solution for your problem, much faster than uh, using uh, random um, optimization, because sampling requires at least a certain number of tests. And maybe you don't have so much time, or your model is really very costly, to be tested. Let's just imagine a very complex uh, neural network. And the answer is yes. The answer is bias optimization. So let's talk about it. The key idea about uh, bias optimization 
is that we don't need to optimize based on our machine learning algorithm. We can, much in a much easier way, optimize a proxy function, which is called the surrogate function. What is this? Basically, it's a model of a model. And this, you know, second order model will just, you know, try to figure out, given certain hyperparameters, what will be the behavior of your model. Naturally, in order to do so, you need some experiments, which are costly. But hopefully, you just need to take the minimum number of such experiments in order to fit the enough information to inform this surrogate function and to make it work appropriately in order to figure out what can work in, the, in terms of hyperparameters on your problem. This is perfect if there are, for example, no gradients, as we say, for your problem. If testing this function is very expensive because it can take a much less number of rounds of test than, you know, just directly optimizing on your, your algorithm. And even it works if your search space is noisy and enough complex. So not just easy as the support vector machine, you know, um, search space we demonstrated before. And by using optimization, just couples this surrogate function with an acquisition function. Because as the surrogate just models how your model will behave, this acquisition function will take the information from the surrogate and decide not only what other experiments to run in order to improve the surrogate function itself, but also what tests to take in order to provide to you the best, uh, the best solution. So for testing directly, which is the best combination giving the best results. We can say that in this way, there's a balance between exploration and exploitation. With exploration, you actually are looking, you know, for the best experiments to fit your surrogate function. And with exploitation, you are just looking for the best experiment to prove that the surrogate function is working at its best. And uh, usually, the uh, most common algorithm that is using such kind of problems is the Gaussian process. Here we have to make a very, a couple of more parentheses. First of all, you may have noticed that I talked about a model that models the behavior of another model. So you may think, well, actually, models have hyperparameters. So also this surrogate function doesn't have hyperparameters. Yes, it does, actually. But you can confidently use, you know, usually the default values and just try, to, you know, to tweak it a little if you really want to experiment, if you can get a better result in, you know, a shorter time. But you shouldn't worry about the hyperparameters of a bias optimization. Just use it as it is. And the second point is that uh, actually I'm telling you exactly how, you know, the scikit optimize, which is one of the various packages, works. So I'm just explaining to you about the Gaussian process, which is, you know, the engine running it. But it's not just the only approach. We mentioned before that there are other packages, and one of these is Optuna. Optuna actually uses a, a little different approach. So um, in this parenthesis, where is the Bayesian part? The Bayesian part is that actually you are building a surrogate function, which is taking the information from its uh, previous experiments, from, from prior knowledge. And actually, it is modeling exactly the probability of having a score given a certain number of uh, a certain setting of hyperparameters. But this is not the only you know, approach you take in Bayesian estimation, because you can just use the transformation of this. So you could use, for example, just the multiplication of a probability of a certain score for the probability of certain hyperparameters given a score, which is exactly what Optuna does. So Optuna just, you know, models something a little bit different from uh, scikit-optimize. So we will stick to 
how scikit optimize works and basically he works with his surrogate function taking experiments and just predicting about how the model should behave but it provides you know another very precious information for this kind of optimization to work he won't simply tell you about how your model will behave given certain hyperparameters he will also give you an estimate of the uncertainty the model has in order to predict this and this is very important for the acquisition function because by observing and Gaussian process in every prediction just give you the mean so the expectation of the results and the standard deviation of the results that he expects so he will you know just by processing the information about the expected results and the uncertainty about it the acquisition function can suggest fewer experiments in order to exploit so to take of course as a test, the, uh, the points where the function expects the best minimization results or to take uh, the points where it is most uncertain because here it can you know, provide a very good result as a bad one. So it's very important this kind of uh, uh, Gaussian process to have clearly in mind that uh, it provides to you an estimate and also an uncertainty of the estimates. And we can see quickly before going to the ax and explain how you can leverage this kind of algorithm in your work, how it works. There is a very simple um, example in the uh, Scikit Optimize website. In this example, you are just you know going to optimize based on a single hyperparameter, going from minus two to two, which is actually on the x-axis. And you can have you know a score a fit score from the model going from minus one to one and your target is to minimize it and when you start running the bayesian optimization actually the gaussian process will need some experiments usually these starting experiments the initialization are taken by you know random optimization so they are random numbers and this is very important because it will give the starting point, the starting, you know, function building for the Gaussian process to create its surrogate function. And in this case, in the panel A, you can see how this green line represents the function as intended at that uh, time with a certain given experiment by the Gaussian process. And, uh, you know, the light green cloud it's just the uncertainty about it. So the bias optimization uh, acquisition function just takes you know, the combination of these two information and decide in the panel B to test a certain point in you know, the space of the hyperparameters. And when it tests it, it just provides it to the uh, surrogate function, which rebuilds how the curve is made and provides the necessary estimates and uh, the necessary uncertainty to pick another point to be tested. The process doesn't take too long you know, to figure out exactly the shape of a very compatible surrogate function that can really replace the real you know, uh, performance function of your real model and just tell you exactly which is the best, you know, point you can see in the uh, panel C. So this is in the end the complete optimization. So having given you a very brief, a very fast overview about hyperparameters, optimization, grid search, random search, by optimization, let's just reason about uh, how to hack in this case Sakit optimize. There's one function inside Scikit Optimize called GP Minimize. This is actually a core engine for optimization. In the example I usually provide, I use a wrapper, Biaser CV, which actually contains this function. But I suggest you just to go beyond this wrapper 
and build your own optimization process because you can have very great advantages. And what kind of action, what kind of you know parameters you should set in this GP minimize? First of all, you should set the initial points to zero. Initial points are you know the warm start of the uh, surrogate function. So usually they are picked by random search. Actually, that's something that you can do by yourself or you can use previous experiments. So just set it to zero and handle it by yourself. Then you have to set a low number of calls because you don't need to set the calls you know, for the entire optimization process. You just need to set the calls for you know just a unit of optimization. It could be just one, one call or a minimal number. So you can control time and the computational cost much easier. Then you can change the acquisition function. So basically the standard is the GP edge, which is a kind of weighted heuristics, which will choose a different uh, kind of exploration or exploitation um, heuristics. And uh, you can decide automatically, or you keep this one, or you just use the PI, so the probability of improvement, if you want to emphasize the exploration, so you want to have a, as much complete overview of how the surrogate function can work, or you can, you know, just set it for the exploitation. So just try to get immediately very good results from your optimization, and in doing so, do some exploration, which is the EI, the expected improvement. It's a different approach. In the probability of improvement, you are actually taking of the Gaussian process more into consideration the uncertainty of estimates. In the EI, the expected improvement, you are instead just picking uh, and waiting more uh, the expected uh, uh, results, so the estimation, the curve itself. And two very important points is that uh, you have to set by yourself, initially they are just known, but as you iterate in the GP minimize, you are just to use the X con zero and epsilon con zero. They are just lists, one list containing the set of test hyperparameters, and there are one, the results. This is very important because it will help you to feed the loop all your optimization with previous results. It can help you to stop. It can help you to store away the results and reuse them later. Of course, don't forget to set the random state number for reproducibility. Let's see a very simple uh, schematics of this. Later, we will see also some code. Basically, you create an objective function, and this objective function is actually containing all your CV strategy, your scoring, so your evaluation measure, your data, so your features, and your target, and also your model. Or, in case, for example, you are just trying to optimize a neural network, a function to generate the model you have to test. And all this is incorporated into that. The objective function also takes some free inputs, which are the parameters, the hyperparameters you want to test. And actually, it receives it from this GP minimize function that I presented for, uh, for you from the scikit optimize. This function will take the objective and use it to get a feedback from the testing of parameters. And this feedback is then used to model the surrogate function. Of course, the GP minimize will also use the, all the previous information. So the priors that you have are represented by X con zero and epsilon con zero, list of uh, previous hyperparameters and previous results gotten from them, and we produce an enriched, so enlarged, X con zero, epsilon con zero, containing also the new tested uh, results. And this is just, you know, a circular iteration that after a while we provide to you the expected optimization. I want to briefly just mention that, uh, of course, GP, so Gaussian process minimization, is not the only approach that you can take. 
So I want to underline that you also have a forest minimized where the surrogate function is not a Gaussian process, but it's a random forest or extremely randomized trees model. This is very important when you are optimizing neural networks because Gaussian process expect to, you know, model a uh, kind of smooth hyperplane in the hypercube of hyperparameters. So it's quite sensible if you have discontinuities. These discontinuities can be, you know, given by the kind of hyperparameters you are working with. And often you will have, for example, binary ones or, you know, uh, categorical ones, for instance, what kind of activation should I use in my hidden layers or should I use, uh, you know, dropout or not, or su should I use uh, batch normalization or not? So in narrow architecture search, the procedure by which you optimize an architecture of a neural network for your purposes, for your problem, you can have many kind of different hyperparameters of different types and with many discontinuities. Actually, as they work, decision trees, uh, forest of decision trees, they are more suitable for, you know, modeling a discontinuous, you know, hyperplane on the um, hyperspace of uh, uh, hyperparameters. So this is the suggested choice in that case. And finally, I want just to tell you that you have a dummy minimized because I mentioned before that you shouldn't use the initialization. So actually, since you had to start with, uh, you know, some experiments and you cannot but take, a, take them by chance, actually, this is actually what you have to use the dummy minimize. And uh, let's now go to the Ekings uh, because here things will get more interesting. And uh, you can find all the code working one on these two Kaggle notebooks. We are inspired by the 30 days of uh, ML and is a regression problem. The first notebook will use XGBoost and the second one is a TensorFlow uh, neural network. But let's see the acts, which are very important for actually doing a more interesting work in optimization. And uh, we are not the kind of things you can find, for example, just by using Optuna uh, in, uh, you know, the, the standard, the core, you know, fitting, uh, um, fitting function. So the first act is to use the number of rounds as an implicit um, hyperparameter and to uh, rely on early stopping. How can you do that? Basically, if you can, you know, uh, work um, in the objective function and incorporate your cross-validation strategy, you can also use the nested cross-validation approach. So you can, for example, in the first iteration, just split between train and validation for each fold. And then in a second level uh, cross-validation or, for example, test train, uh, sampling, just pick inside the train another validation set. And as you use the first validation set for testing purposes, so it will tell you the results of the experiment. Mm -hmm. And since we are in cross validation, it will be the mean of the results. The second inside the uh, second cross validation inside the first will help you to figure out where to stop. And basically, as you are training and checking on the second level portion, validation portion, you are not doing any kind of adaptive fitting. And you can rely basically on giving to your model a very high number of iterations and just let it stop when on the second level validation, your model is not performing anymore. In code, this is done very simply. So you have your function, the make objective, and this function make objective will actually create your objective after, you know, a decoration that uh, 
is actually required by circuit optimized because it works by lists of hyperparameters, but you will reason better, especially with your models, if you work by the, a dictionary of uh, hyperparameters. So you will just naturally convert lists into dictionaries, keeping their naming. So inside this objective, you just create your um, logic for cross-validation. Here you have a split, and this split will just work out for every fold uh, a train index and a test index. Then inside your train index, you sample a part of it for validation purposes. So this is actually what will be put for checking to your model for the early stopping. And that actually will allow you to simply, you know, use what you practically do every time you train a uh, gradient boosting model like you know like gbm or xdboost or when you are training for example a neural network and uh, picking up the best network after um, you know all your trial iterations another very important hacking that you can you know concretize by using this approach is actually pruning experiments. You can prune experiments, you know, by cross-validation because you can actually record every time the performance of each fold. And you can decide, you know, going on in the cross-validation only if each fold performs, for example, in the top um, quartile of a, um, of the results that you obtained before. So in terms of code, in the make objective function, before returning your objective function, you just can put, for example, a check, which that will check if your history, it's enough long, so you have enough you know, data points to consider, and we'll check if actually your test score, the score you are you know, obtaining for your fold, is in the top, you know, 25 percent uh, percentile uh, of, uh, you know, the historical data. If it is not, you can safely stop because you can expect that the average of uh, all the uh, faults, the complete number of faults, will actually be a top score. So we will shorten, you know, drastically the number of, uh, you know, faults that you are doing for experiments that are not working. And another thing that you can kind of act that you can do, if you just you know go into the uh, inner you know workings of uh, Scikit Optimize, mm -hmm. is that you can make you know your callbacks even smarter. By default, you can have a few callbacks, but since you are working you know in cyber optimization, so defining cross validation, defining how you know for example early stopping works, and you know computing the time of each of these operations, you can have, you know, a moving average of performances, which can help you to predict more exactly when actually to stop in your, you know, repeated experiments. You can have the timings of the execution, of course, the number of rounds, all a lot of information that can help you to guide better, you know, how much you should insist optimizing. And so this can help you to save time in this case, uh, I use this kind of, you know, just handmade callback, and it is just simply, you know, saving, you know, the results. But this is, you know, quite useful. For example, if you want to uh, save them, if you are using callback into your Google Drive, and every time, you know, your optimization stops because you have finished your budget or GPU, just come back and, and use it. Another hacking, very quick, that you can use is alpha in search space. So basically, you can change your search space as you are doing optimization. And again, this is because you are controlling how you are optimizing step by step. So step by step, you can decide to provide you know, a smaller search space because you have seen that testing exactly on one part of a search space is not giving you the exact results. And another very interesting, you know, hacking is injecting randomness. Uh, what 
does it mean? As we said before, it's very important that you start with a set of experiments, you know, the random initialization that helps your surrogate function to work. But if you have many, you know, uh, many hyperparameters to optimize, it cannot work so well with just a few uh, random iteration, initial random ones. So your surrogate function can have blind spots. And from time to time, you can decide to stop Bayesian optimization and just revert to random optimization for a while. By doing so, you are just providing points to the surrogate function that maybe the surrogate function would have not looked for. And this can, for example, break some local optima. A procedure that you can use is that of simulated annealing, which actually, you know, just, you know, uh, alternates optimization with random optimization. So you set a threshold temperature, so it's a probability of recurring to random optimization. And at each step of optimization, you can just, you know, throw dice from a uniform distribution and check if a value you pick is exactly below the threshold. And uh, if it is below, you can run, you know, a random search. If it is above, you can run the bias optimization. Of course, as you proceed with optimization, this threshold, this temperature will lower, will lower. So it will be less and less chance to try something random. And this can really accelerate and help you to find better results in the end, even if you know it can mean to take a detour from bias optimization itself. And another hack that I suggest to you before you know arriving at the neural networks is visualizing your results. Um, as a practitioner, I find more and more important uh, to be able to explain why we reach a certain results. Of course, if you are doing a Kaggle competition, what matters is the optimization itself. So maybe you won't care too much understanding what type of parameters are significant from what are, you know, in influence or, you know, something that you can take out. But if you have to explain why you reached a certain set of hyperparameters, and this is important because actually you are, by doing so, defining the functional form of your model, you can use all the visualizations opportunities offered by Sakit Optimize, which to my knowledge is the only one to, to make the user able to do so. So for instance, in this visualization, I try to figure out what work in the problem of uh, the 30 days of machine learning problem organized by Kaggle work or not. And it was surprising to find out that uh, actually certain parameters were quite unuseful, while certain others were quite determinant. And another thing that uh, uh, actually emerged during the 30 days of ML is that uh, um, when you are doing hyperparameter optimization, you expect the best results, but actually you can have a set of best results. And actually, if you don't have so much choice in what you have to ensemble, in the case of this competition, actually, you know, the gradient boosting was the was kind of overperforming all other algorithms, and you didn't have so much choice. You had to use XT boost and maybe something a little more. And if you can figure out and the procedure that, uh, you know, we act together by this explanation uh, showed to you. Uh, if you can, you know, figure out exactly all the experiments uh, and all the results from the experiments, uh, you can also cluster them. By clustering, you can find that there are pockets in the hyperparameter space that maybe they offer a very good uh, performance. The interesting thing is that uh, by using these pockets, even if you use the same algorithm, so in this case, HTBoost, you're actually creating very different solutions, very uncorrelated one that will overperform that you just ensemble them. So if your objective is to create something working uh, very well for a competition or 
obtaining a state-of-the-art results, consider that uh, hyperparameter optimization can provide to you not just the optimum, but also a set of optimum. So just cluster your result for uh, some more uh, uh, opportunity uh, of building a diverse set of uh, predictors. And finally, we have optimizing for neural architecture search. So you may wonder what is different at this point, because we touched all the, you know, characteristics that, uh, you know, optimizing a neural architecture should require from a Bayesian optimization process. So first of all, we just already described that uh, you can pass a model, but you can also pass a function or a class that creates your model. And we also mentioned that uh, actually using trees instead of Gaussian processes can help you to model very discontinuous, uh, you know, the um, uh, discontinuous system of uh, uh, hyperparameters. So it's much more ideal in this case. And we also demonstrate that uh, you can use early stopping and as well as early stopping, you can use also, you know, the best model of a fixed set of uh, uh, iterations as your uh, predictors. So this is all possible if you just build, you know, the nested cross validation we described before. And so basically we all, we have everything that's needed to optimize this kind of problem. So in this uh, code example, very simply, uh, quite quickly, in TensorFlow, I will show to you that uh, I just created all the inputs for the problem. So the continuous and the categoricals are just fit into functions, secular function, um, sorry, TensorFlow functions that can transform them in case of numerics, just, you know, uh, normalize them. So remove the mean standardized by you know, the standard deviation and in the case of uh, categorical ones create an embedding with uh, you know different uh, you know uh, dimensionalities and uh, everything then can be decided by the parameters that you give the number of layers the nodes you provide the network is structured accordingly to these uh, hyperparameters that you provide and also, for example, the learning rate of the optimizer can be uh, part of a hyperparameters optimization set because you can just feed them as parameters into this function. And then the search space will just have to represent this complexity. And you just run the exact same procedure that. Uh, um, we described before for, for example, XGBoost, and you get the, the same uh, optimized results. So I concluded, I hope I didn't put too much uh, meat on fire. So I give you back the uh, microphone, Abhishek. Thank you very much, Luca. It was, it was a really very interesting talk, so much to learn. Uh, we do have a lot of questions. So one question that I would like to ask you, how often do you use hyperparameter optimization in your day-to-day -day job? All, almost always, basically. <laughs> Apart when, when I'm using, you know, like linear models, which don't require so much effort, you know, you have just some regularization parameters to, to fix, basically always, because we have to find the best sets of hyperparameters using, for example, gradient boosting, or I have to find out, you know, the best uh, neural architecture for many problems. So it's quite common. But the reason why I arrive, you know, uh, not stopping to, uh, to wrapper functions and finding a way to to use to my advantage, you know, the core functions of this library, Scikit Optimize. Great. It seems like you're a Scikit Optimize fan. Yes, you can. You can be sure of that. <laughs> so, <laughs> of course, Ozuna can get better results, especially in a Kaggle competition. Yeah, we, exactly uh, I like using Optuna a lot. Yes, it's faster because it, it prunes the space of your hyperparameters, and so it stops searching if something's not working. So, by default, Scikit Optimize doesn't do that. 
I explain, you know, the hacker, you know, you know, monitoring the results of your faults and, you know, not proceeding if a fault in your testing is not performing well. But that's a knack. By default, you know, the approach proposed by Scikit Optimize, you know, just take the complete test. Optuna doesn't. And it's a different, you know, approach. Sometimes can work better the, you know, um, trio pardon uh, estimator approach, which is the uh, uh, the different, you know, bias and part of a formulation I explained before. So you are not modeling the score given the hyperparameters, but you are just doing the reverse. So you, you have already highlighted some differences between Scikit Optimize and Optuna, but there is a question that uh, is asking a little bit about Hyperopt2. And uh, the question is extended. Like uh, the person is asking which library should we use and why are there any situations in which you should use Scopt or Hyperopt or Optuna and where when you should not use these? or you should do something else. There are so many, so many different libraries for hyperparameter yes. optimization, right? Yes, there are. And Abhishek is like, you know, the dilemma, should I use TensorFlow or PyTorch? So basically I suggest you to test everything you can and to get accustomed with a library. As I said, Optuna is exceptional, especially in uh, Kaggle competitions. Uh, you need, uh, you know, you have a notebook with a fixed time and you need to find that fixed time the best optimization. So it's very fast. It's faster than second optimize. But I can find second optimize better for my problems because I can hack it more. I can really change it a lot. And you know, I can keep track of all the experiments because it's very easy to keep track. Since it's just modeling the results given the hyperparameters, I just need two lists: a list of the tested hyperparameters, a list of the results, and that's enough. I can, you know, reproduce every optimization every time and improve it and add my own tests and add the, you know, random tests and so on. I cannot do that with Optuna. So it really depends on what you're looking for. I suggest you to test the different libraries, see if they work for you, see if they work for your problem. And if you like them, just go for it. In any case, Hyperopt and Optuna has the same approach. Yeah. And uh, okay, uh, moving on to uh, other questions. So uh, this question is coming to surrogate models. Is there any specific use case where a Gaussian process performs poorly compared to random forest or tree parson estimators? Yes, for example, with uh, optimization of uh, neural networks. Um, when you have, for example, many binary flags, so you are building your neural networks with uh, many different, you know, steps, changing steps. So should I use, uh, for example, uh, this kind of layer or this other portion of layer? Should I use a skip layer or not? This is kind of discontinuous space of hyperparameters. It's not continuous. It's not like a support vector machine where you have a continuous, you know, range of values for each parameter and the Gaussian process can look through it. Gaussian process work very well for continuous spaces because it works by analogy. It looks for similar results given similar inputs. Random forest based on the decision trees doesn't have this requirement because the decision are just splits across the state space that you are, you know, analyzing. So you can have, you know, sharp changes of your decisions and that works much better. Of course, okay. my suggestion is always try because <laughs> uh, in my experience, you know, theory is one thing. Uh, empirical results are completely different. True, true. <laughs> but yeah, you, you can, you know, stick to this as a good idea what can work or not. So uh, this question is, uh, um, can I use the same randomness techniques that you explained for biochain optimization for a genetic algorithm approach if the problem is maximizing constraints? Mm, okay. Uh, I don't get completely the question because actually there's another range of algorithms for 
hyperparameter optimization that are based on genetic algorithms. The problem with genetic algorithms is that they are very costly. So they cost a lot. So if you want to use them for optimization, you need something not so difficult to test. So if your question instead is, I want to optimize genetic algorithms based on Bayesian optimization, so I say, yes, it's possible because you know genetic algorithms are not differentiable so you are exactly in you know the practical state case when bias optimization works the best but it's a little bit out of my experience with genetic algorithms telling you how to apply that so if you want to write to me we can have a, a discussion about that uh, it would be a pleasure so maybe contact you on twitter or linkedin Yes, better on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, okay, moving on. So um, we do have a couple of questions about feature engineering and hyperparameter optimization. So let's take the first one. I hope you have a few more minutes. Yes, of course. Okay, great. So how do you combine feature engineering and hyperparameter optimization? And do you keep the same hyperparameters during all of the feature engineering? What if you create a lot of new features? Is it better better to do hyperparameter optimization afterwards? Of course it is. Actually, this is a question that emerged, you know, also during the 30 days of machine learning. The point is that you are taking an algorithm and make it work at best, giving a certain input. If you change the input, you have to redo that. Probably most hyperparameters won't be so different, but the point is what we are doing feature engineering for. Basically, you are just trying to transform your space of information, your features, existing features, into different features where your problem is more easily manageable. So if you think of a classification, you are just you know restructuring the space in order to have the classes in a more separable way by your algorithm. Clearly, if you are successful in doing so, running hyperparameter uh, optimization after feature engineering can provide you even better results. Okay, and uh, another question about uh, feature engineering. So, so, yeah, in general, you should always do hyperparameter optimization after you have done all your feature yes, engineering, exactly. well, and always in a cross validation loop, I think, right? Yes. <laughs> But the trick uh, maybe someone wants to ask is why not to put feature engineering as an hyperparameter? <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 You can do that. Why not? You can do that. So this question was very early in the presentation, and uh, the person asks how much of modern machine learning is based on bias and statistics is. All of the trending machine learning is just classical Bayesian statistics packaged as something cool. Oh my God. <laughs> Any views? Okay, okay. Let, let's take it at a, you know, just face you want to? It, It's an opinion. No, I don't want to comment. <laughs> because there um, are, you know, many, many different um, cultures inside, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. and each culture, the statistical one, the more engineeristic one, the machine learning one, the, you know, theoretical, the empirical, they all have their reason of being. So I cannot say anything. If you, if you say so, it's, uh, it's your point of view. Actually, it's just a facet of a very complex domain. So. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, oh, it's your opinion, it's everyone's opinion. So uh, the question, this question is about acquisition function for specific use cases. So can you talk a little bit about how we can make our own acquisition functions for if we have specific use cases? Okay, basically um, creating your own uh, is something that you know, shouldn't bother you too much mm -hmm. because given the fact that, for example, in a Gaussian process, you have an estimation, which is actually the mean of a distribution and the standard deviation, you don't have so many ways to combine them. Usually the approaches are you look at the estimation, so you try to 
minimize, or in this case, maximize the, the results, in, the, in this case, get the, the minimum by looking just at that or by looking at the just uncertainty. So you just look in order to complete as much, make as more realistic as possible your surrogate function, or you combine them. And usually the combination, since is minimization, you take you know, your expected value, the mean, and you just subtract your standard deviation. Of course, you can emphasize by multiplication the, the standard deviation, but again, you will just fall back to one of the previous two cases I told you. So you don't have so many different ways of building, you know, the acquisition function. And I wouldn't, you know, uh, stop too much on, on, on that. Uh, just use, you know, the different options that's provided to you. What I would care more is to provide in case, you know, it's difficult, your program to be optimized, more informed experiments or more random experiments, especially randomization, it's always assured that it costs a little computationally, but it can, you know, help your problem to get uh, uh, away from being struck. So go away from, you know, local minima. Okay, uh, I think this this question you have already answered, but uh, let's just take it. So during the feature engineering phase, is it better to keep the same value of number of estimators or the same value of early stopping rounds or maybe different estimators in each run? Uh, basically, uh, what I do is to keep my experiment fixed when I'm working with uh, feature engineering because it can really provide to me information if it is working or not when you are you know testing different combination of features for example interactions or you can try to combine them in a more sophisticated way the first feedback that you have to get is are they working or not obviously if you change the, your hyperparameters of a model you are using at the time if you change the way you do cross-validation, you are just putting confounding effects that, you know, can just uh, make not clear if what you are doing is working or not. So I suggest you to keep fixed a testing procedure, so cross-validation and model during feature engineering. This will help you to evaluate if what you are doing is good performing or not. When you are satisfied with feature engineering, then you start working on the model. So yeah. on picking the model parameters. Right, right. And yeah, that's what I would also do. So uh, yeah, I think uh, that's, that's a lot of questions now. And uh, we are already out of time. So thank you so much, Luca, for joining me today. But before thank we you, leave... Abisha. Before we leave, do you want to talk a little bit about what's your next project in terms of what kind of book are you writing now? Okay, <clears throat> it has be become quite difficult writing books. Uh, you know, pandemics, uh, working hard, family is making harder and harder, you know, writing something. And I invite you, Abhishek, that you find a lot of time and you already published something great in these recent days, but new book, you know, becoming data scientist in 30 days, something, but I invite you a lot. I, I have no idea what, how could you find all the time to write that? Anyway. You know, there, there is no content in that book. <laughs> it's all empty pages. <laughs> so yeah, I do have time, like five minutes to write okay. that book. <laughs> That's great. Anyway, I couldn't subtract myself from trying this last effort. It has been over 10 years I participated in Kaggle competitions. And apart from the joy of competing, I learned a lot. I made a lot of friends. I knew you, of course, Abhishek. Too. And it has been a great experience. And I want to share with everyone that want to tackle on this kind of challenges, what are the tricks, uh, what are the approaches, but also what could be the best mental attitude and expectation to take in there. And with um, Kagler, um, like me, Korat, we are just writing together a small book on machine learning and data analysis with Kagler. So 
just expecting the next month uh, a new publication and uh, this time focuses specifically on Kaggle. That's great to hear. I hope you send me a copy. Um, of course. <laughs> and uh, before you leave, uh, do you uh, will you share the presentation and the links to yes. your social media profile? Okay, yes, great. Of course. I will add them as pinned comment to the video. And thank you, everyone, for joining. It was a really, very great talk. Thank you, Luca, for taking the thank time out too. of your busy schedule. And uh, uh, I will see you guys next week. And uh, have a very nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.